Uh, but one guy who always faithfully makes his appointments with us is financial Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad's Group of Financial Advisors on Winchester Avenue in Martinsburg. Phil, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Excellent. Thank you, Phil. You never miss an appointment with us, except for those 638s yeah. once in a while. I was going to say, he's not awake all the time, but he's always <laughs> here. <laughs> <laughs> the Well, you, the the six thirties. I think I've. I was thinking in my head. You made it sound a little dramatic that I missed numerous times. <laughs> I think I've missed the six thirty two, possibly three times, and they were within the same week. I do believe. I think. I think that's the case. I think I got you uh, multiple times in the same week. But aside from that, I, I haven't missed it much. There was a couple times, Phil. Whenever uh, the market would go down precipitously, and you didn't want to have to answer Jerome Powell questions, you would conveniently have some kind of a trip you had to go to, <laughs> or whatever. I'm not saying that's not true, but I, I gave you a heads up. <laughs> okay, uh, I believe you, Phil. Kind of. <clears throat> hey, by the way, uh, our uh, Steelers in the preseason. Phil, just when you thought the offense couldn't look any worse than it looked last year, along comes the preseason this year. <laughs> They've looked pretty rough in the preseason, but but the I still I have to put that preseason tag on it. Last year they looked like the best offense in the NFL during the preseason, and it quickly flipped. So we said last year, uh, I think after the week one or week two, that we're we're no longer going to pay attention to the preseason. So I'm hopeful that this is just vanilla offense and they're not throwing the ball down the field, and there's a player missing here, missing there, and we could hope for better times once week one shows up. But, boy, that offense does <laughs> that offense does look bad. Phil, let's uh, talk a little bit of money here because I want to bring up Jerome Powell's name. You and I have, and Mr. Gilstrap, have differed on our opinions toward Mr. Powell and his performance as the Fed chair and whether or not he waited too long to begin raising interest rates and whether or not he's waiting too long to lower interest rates. I read this article in uh, Kiplinger magazine over the weekend, and it talked about how to read inflation rates. And apparently, in America, we interpret inflation different than they do around the West, rest of the world, and that we include some home uh, owners' information, home buyers versus renters' information in our calculations, which isn't done in Europe or Asia or whatever when they're calculating inflation. In this particular article written by this guy who's a – in the financial world, was saying that we really need to get off that system because it creates artificially high inflation in America as compared to if you took that index out like the rest of the world does. And then he goes on to spell out some reasons. I don't want to get into a whole bunch of detailed information uh, about the article. I don't even know that I can recall all of it, to be honest with you. But he made a pretty compelling case as to why cost of owning a home versus renting and, and, and such shouldn't really be included in, in an inflationary calculation. I don't know how much you know about that one way or the other, but it, it seems to me if we're calculating inflation around the rest of the world one way, we should be doing it. We shouldn't be the, the only people calculating it in a different way in America. It seems like if that's how you do inflation, that's the way we should do inflation. Yeah, well, I don't I don't know too much about how the rest of the world calculates inflation. Uh, I do believe that that should be included in, in on our inflation because it is part of what consumers pay. So maybe you're not in the market for a new home or, or renting, but if you are, then that's part of what goes into inflation. And when you look at what rates do when, when, we, when we play with rates, whether we're raising them or lowering them, the, one of the first sectors to see that impact is is the cost of living is is cost of homes and rents so and that's their main weapon to control inflation is is rate movement whether it's higher or lower and the first sector that that hits is home buyers and then renters would would shortly there follow so i would agree that it should be in now the one thing that we do remove and it sometimes it confuses me which is which quite honestly but is uh, the cost of energy and food and I don't know why in the world. Now, there's two. There's a core, and then there's an overall. I don't know why we would pay attention to uh, to. I could see why we would remove energy in some cases. I can't see why we would re remove food, but I could see why we would remove energy because small moves with OPEC could impact what we would do as far as uh, raising or lowering rates. 
but food cer- certainly should be in there, even if food has an overwhelming, uh, is, is impacted overwhelmingly with the cost of transportation. But still, uh, I, I do think that uh, those, those things should be included. But when we look at, you know, this inflation and this debate that we, we've all had of whether or not Jerome Powell has done a good job or not to this point, we still say the game's not over and the game may not be over for quite some time. But in a, in a vacuum, uh, when you look at the things that they are they are specifically uh, mandated with, which is uh, uh, price uh, price continuation or inflation and unemployment in a vacuum, you have to say I don't I don't know how we couldn't we have to say that they've done a pretty decent job where they get uh, they get some pain for, from you and rightfully so is when our markets fall like they did a few weeks ago when that unemployment number kicked up to 4.3 and our markets tumbled. Well, we have to keep in mind that supposedly, and, and I'm sure it plays it plays a role even if it shouldn't, but the movement of the markets has n- what Jerome Powell does as far as rates are concerned. Uh in regards to the housing part of that, there's, it was more complicated than just what the cost of rent is or what the cost of a house is. I would agree with you that Did that's I lose uh, everyone. That you still can you hear us still, Phil? We can hear you. Uh-oh. I guess we've lost Phil. Don't I, cuss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he'll he'll call back. Right. right. Yeah. There, there was a. Uh, it was more complicated than just what's the cost of rent versus the cost of housing. It was a pretty compelling case. On you can probably look it up on Kiplinger's website and learn more about it in that calculation. You're about to say, William. Yeah, I was going to say the the subject of inflation confuses me. Uh, it's, it's measured in large part of when someone wants to start the discussion. Uh, for example, if you're talking about inflation prior to COVID, it is a very large, large number. Mm-hmm. If you start, start the discussion of uh, the last two years, it's a smaller number. Uh, and then where does the salaries come into play? Uh, I thought uh, it was mentioned last Friday that, yeah, we've had inflation, but the salaries, at least for the middle income, for the last couple of so years have kept up with the price of inflation. Uh, is there an indicator, is CPI uh, the indicator of looking at inflation from a certain point in time and looking at salaries. In other words, the point I think I'm trying to make in a very confused sort of way is, to me, the whole subject of inflation is a lot more complicated, a lot more moving parts than we tend to think of in first blush. I think Phil is back now, too. Philip? I'm back, and sorry about that. I said some brilliant things that you guys may not have heard, and I can't repeat them. But I, I picked and, up on and then <laughs> what made it what made it worse, Phil? He ca- he called upon me, and I was trying to show the brilliancy of Phil, and I fell way I, I, short. I mean, it, it, it was off. really really good, but I can't, it can't be repeated. So I don't know what what you missed. But the end part, of what I did here, and it, this is part of it, is wage inflation, and there's a huge debate on what wage inflation is and how it pertains to the overall inflation. But wage, wage wages are an inflationary pressure. So when wages go up, as does it help support inflation. We've said this all along. You know, depending upon who you are and where you stand is how you look at the economy. When I go to the grocery store, I heard my father-in-law saying this yesterday. He says, I don't know how in the world we can say the economy is in good shape. And this is the overwhelming perception mm-hmm. of most people, including me. When, I, when, I'm, when I'm out shopping or, or traveling or anything. But how can we say the economy's in good shape when, when it costs so daggone much to, you know, his example is buying a bag of ice. But the, but the end result is it is supported by consumers, and some of that is supported by wage inflation. So if we're willing to pay it, they are going to charge it. And they were going to charge it until we stop paying it. And I know on an individual basis we say, well, I'm not paying that or I don't do that. But overall we do, and it's being shown time and time again in the numbers. And that is one of the reasons why this has been such a long battle to get inflation down to where we want, where they want it to be. Now, when we say we want it to be, John and I agree completely. We could say, hey, let's just stop at 2.5%. That's a normalized inflation rate. Why does it have to be all the way down to 2%? But part of the sticky part of inflation, they keep saying, well, there's a sticky part. There's a sticky part of inflation. 
part of that sticky part is caused by wage inflation. Now, when we look at wage inflation compared to overall inflation, at some points it's kept up, but overall it has not kept up. So we, we would then say, well, it, it, that can't be part of the problem because wages haven't kept up with the overall inflation rate, but it has kept up to a certain extent, and it enables us as consumers to continue to purchase these things, even at higher rates, and then our willingness to do so, and then that's where we get into the, the conversations of how much consumer debt, which is outrageous, the amount of consumer debt that we as a country carry, credit cards and car notes and so forth, but that is our willingness to do so, and then our confidence that we'll be able to meet those debt service payments because we're making a little bit more than what we were making before. So wages in itself doesn't go into the CPI bill. That's not part of the equation, but part of what is supporting that is wages. So it's in there. It's supported by wages, but it's not in that overall calculation. Phil, that's nobody's willingness to do that. That's the necessity to do that. Mm, the consumer mm, debt. I mean, you. how else are you going to make ends meet? I mean, at, at a certain level of of the consumer, how else are they going to pay their bills except to endure more consumer debt? Well, but that's not what we're, you know, when you look at some of the willingness that I talk about, and I use myself as an example with two daughters, one that just turned 21 yesterday, happy birthday, Abigail, and another that just started her senior year today. Well, Ada needed new shoes, and I use this same boring example over and over again, and she gets the same shoes. It's just the next model up, right? So it's the same pair of shoes every stinking year, but I go get these shoes, and they were $160, and I distinctly remember them being 120 not long ago, and you know what I did? Even That's not a necessity. I could have got her cheaper shoes, but I went in, and I paid for those shoes, and I grumbled all the way out the door. My father-in-law yesterday, who's very, he, he's always been frugal, and he's, he's economically uh, savvy. He always has been. I, I, I use his example in dealing with our clients sometimes. It's how good he does. But he, t- he was talking about buying a bag of ice. And that's not a necessity. He was talking about how much it was at a, at a local Dollar General store. That's not a necessity. We could have gotten our own ice. So it, it may sound silly. It's like, well, I'm not going to buy this ice. I'm just going to make it at home and then and bag it up. But you can do that. If they were charging $20 for that bag, that's what he would have done. But it was to a point where he would grumble but still purchase it. If those shoes that ate a that Ada had to buy was 260 instead of 160, I would have turned course. I would have said, huh, no, I'm not going to do this, and I wouldn't have walked out with those shoes in my hand complaining about how much they cost. So we have still been at that point where we're complaining, but we're not doing anything about it. Now, some of them, you're right, they're, 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 it is a necessity. Gas is a necessity. Life-saving medicine is a necessity. But blueberries, in a necessity, you could find something to replace your your one of your favorite grocery store items, or you could purchase the Food Line brand of yogurt instead of the Oikos, or you could buy the bag cereal instead of the post cereal. So you have options, but you don't do it. You, we, as a society, we're still buying those expensive items and grumbling on the way out the door and talking about how bad the economy is. And include me in on that because I'm the same way. I'm doing the same exact thing. I'm complaining every step of the way but I'm still doing it, and as a society, that's what we're doing. Man, you brought back a bad memory, Phil. I remember my grandmother used to buy us bags of that puffed rice. <laughs> remember that yeah. puffed rice cereal? You had to put 17 pounds of granulated sugar, on, <laughs> if you're a kid, on that puffed rice just yeah. to make it tolerable when you try yeah. to eat it. And, yeah, and, and you know, some of, we, a lot of us did this during COVID, where we, we were so unsure and we were so, so fearful of what may happen. I'm talking about that that late March, April, May, June, where we wouldn't be able to get back out to the store. It was so difficult to get back out to the store. Where in, and we didn't know what was going to happen with our jobs and income. And include me in on that. I didn't know what was going to happen to portfolios, and that's how I'm paid. So include me in on that. We started to grip our, our, our purses a little tighter, and then our spending became only on those necessities. And I still remember going through the store and all these luxury grocery items that I would buy that were kind of quirky, but they were expensive. I didn't get them. I didn't get them, one, because of the price of them, but two, because I was fearful of I needed to pull my dollars closer to me. Now, it turns out as a society that we ended up with much more money because of that behavior than what than what we would have had before, and which is also fueled inflation, by the way. But during that period, we did clutch a little bit tighter. We didn't buy those 
$160 shoes, and we did later on in COVID, but not while we were stuck at home. We didn't buy those $6 bag, bag of ice, which it, it blew his mind, but I, I bet you he won't do it again. But that's kind of where we have been as a consumer over the past few years where we keep saying, hey, it's going to break the consumer's back. This is going to break her back. And it hasn't. It's been proven out in earnings. It's proven out in retail reports. And it's proven also in those inflation reports. We look at that inflation, and we all have our reasons. We all have our debates about what causes this inflation. All of those debates are valid, and all of those are true. But the one thing that we leave out that the cause of inflation is, is the biggest cause of inflation, is the consumer. The consumer has supported that all along. And if consumers weren't purchasing it, they wouldn't put that price on it. If you're selling a widget and nobody's buying it at $20 per widget, you're going to lower your price until they purchase it. And that's where that price point stops. All right. Speaking of inflation, check this out. So this date, 2004, was Google's IPO. If in 2004 you had invested $1,000 in Google on their IPO date, if you could have gotten the stock, mostly only people like Phil can, and his favorite clients can get that kind of stock. It, it, this is the latest date I could find for it in my AI search. February, as of February 5 of 2023, $1,000 in the Google IPO of 2004 will be worth $1,164,133.88. Now, another year, almost a year and a half has gone by. Well, actually, more than a year and a half has gone by since this is calculating that. So I assume that number is even better than a million one sixty four. Phil, there's a, there's an easy thousand dollars returned, huh? There you go. But, the, you know, when we look at some of these, the returns of the S&P in, in our investment portfolios that we always talk about on a short term basis, but underlying is very hypocritical of me, quite honestly, to come on on a, on a weekly and a morning basis and talk about uh, the short term movements of the markets. But in reality, in our business day in our life here, we don't really care about the short term movements of the markets. We're more concerned about the long term, mainly because of what you just said. But let's talk about another reason for inflation. As our stock market has performed so well, let's look at the last 24 years and we had the dot com bubble and then we had the the, uh, the the great recession or with with all the um, uh, the banks failing in 2008 and 2009. We had a pretty rough year in 2015. We had that period during COVID. We had 2022. But through all of those down markets that have scared us all to death, our markets have done really well. So those people that are relying on, and I talk about this with one of your listeners quite often. You know, we do it via text or, or on Facebook Messenger. But part of the, the retirees and what feeds our pensions and when we look at our client base and we, we tell our clients this, like, look, if you're going to spend money, it's best to do it after you've got a 20% return. Do it when the market's up. So if you need a new car, if you need a new roof, if you want to take that trip, do it now. Well, stock market performance is also much smaller than what wage, wage inflation would be. But stock market performance also goes into our consumer confidence, even if you're not using that money. Studies have shown with behavior finance, if the stock market is doing well, even if you're not living off of your portfolio, you feel more comfortable with spending money. If your 401k balance looks so much stronger at the age of 35, even though you may be 35 or 40 years away from using that or utilizing that, you feel more comfortable about the next few months spending money. And, and, and that connection is part of the, the uh, uh, inflationary pressure and those in retirement. So when, when you look at those in retirement that are living, blue-collar workers that are living off corporate earnings, I keep telling people that. It's not just the, the monopoly man that's making this money off of corporate earnings. So that's why I say, hey, cor companies making money is not evil. It's helping feed our blue-collar workers that is in retirement because pensions aren't what they used to be. And, and by the way, pensions are also supported by mark, uh, stock market performance. But we're looking at mom and pop that had retired after 35 years of working a blue-collar job, and they're living off of their portfolios. But for those discretionary expenses or those large expenses that that, uh, that are happening frequently, those are supported by recent stock market performance. And then that's when they pull those dollars out to do that, which, by the way, helps, helps support inflation. You understand that, Bill? 
Yeah. Right. <laughs> no. Uh, but my point much earlier was there's a a lot of inflation is defined on when we have the starting point and the ending point. It is. It is. And, and as John would point out, and then, you know, we always look at it in a vacuum. We'll look at it on a monthly basis and say, hey, it's down. It's at 2.9 now. That's not so bad. But as John so correctly points out, that still means prices are still going up. They're not going down. They're just going up slower. So it's not as if your $14 blueberries at the grocery store, I keep referencing blueberries for a reason, but your $14 blueberries at the grocery stores are not going down in price. They're, they're, continue, they're still going up. They're just going up at a slower pace. But when you look at it over, over time, and there are so many things that go into it, we do have some deflationary categories where prices are beginning to come down. That, that is happening. Now, overall, we don't want to see deflation. We may think that we want to see that as a consumer. We do not want to see deflation. That, that uh, uh, We want to see disinflation. We don't want to see deflation. That's a very bad economic time. You know, I, <clears throat> what, do you, what is your suggestion? It's, it's a real question here because there was a <laughs> – I have been very poor in my life, and I remember having – hearing discussions like this where there's there's another radio and investment guy that would talk about you know all you have to do is put away a few dollars a week and all this and, and we can have all that i didn't have a few dollars mm-hmm. a week to put away and i'm thinking that, don't. That, that there's so much there's kind of a certain gaslighting that is going on about the economy right now and this is what we're talking about where, where people who are living off of their credit cards to buy their groceries, I keep coming back to this segment of society that is much, much larger than I think we're, than we're acknowledging. What is their way out right now? I mean, they're, they're underpaid for the job they're doing. There's not a lot of opportunity for them in a place like West Virginia. Um, what, is, what is their way out for investment? For those of us who have a certain affluence, yeah, the, 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 the future is rosy. What about for those who, where the future is not there yet? Uh, th- th- that section of people, and if I could answer that question, I'd probably be on the ticket in November. But the, and you're right, though. There's so many people that whether inflation's good or bad, John, quite honestly, those people remain the same people. And where they struggle to put money aside, and it's much, much, much later in life before they can start to put money aside for retirement or save for retirement. I think I know who you're talking about. Says, hey, just put a few dollars away a week. Our solution to that, and, and it's mostly too late by the time we get to them, but our clients, the children of our clients, there's a huge window from, say, the age of 16 when you start working just summer jobs or part-time jobs up until the time that you have children and you buy your first home. That is the, the largest saving window that you may have in your entire life other than if you're working past the date that you wanted to retire because you hadn't saved enough, that you have all discretionary income, those deposits early on in life, and I know this isn't a good answer because it's too late for most of these people that we're talking about. 30 seconds, Bill. Those deposits early on in life are what's going to get you through those periods where you simply can't put money away. And you're right. There's a ton of people that simply can't put money away, and I do not have an answer for them. But it is the same amount of people or the same people that can't put money away when inflation is kind of slower as it was uh, prior to COVID. Bill, how do we reach you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Marksburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day. Thank you, guys.